Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Go ahead, like, share the posts. You can even host your own watch party. If you want to host a watch party, you can just look right under this screen and there's a button that says share. And if you share it, it would actually give an opportunity to host a watch party so you can invite your followers, your friends, your colleagues, anyone you think that want to hear about this discussion and go ahead and share it on your page as well so others can watch. Uh, we're going to give a couple minutes just for all that to happen. Um, I want to just say thank you to everyone that's already logged in and ready to go. This is a much needed conversation. We have a lot going on in our nation right now. And, and I often say you don't want to be emotional because emotions don't really produce a whole lot. But we want to make sure that we pause. We kind of regulate our emotions and see how we can bring solutions and change. And I'm so excited. Um, Acceleration Church. We are a church that is definitely committed to our community and what's important to our community is important to us. And so I'm so happy that we have special guests on today where we can touch um, on how the nation is really handling some of the unrest that we're dealing with now from both the political standpoint, a government um, perspective, a law enforcement perspective, as well as a business perspective. We've seen a lot of loitering um, on last night and, 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 and the night before that. And so we really want to make sure that we can provide some solutions and some action plans. And so again, take this time before our guests get on, you don't want to miss this. Share this post, like this post, host a watch party. Some of you may be saying, what can I do? How can I help? And this is a way to help get the message out, get the word out. We have qualified people. We have experts that is going to speak to the current situation, talk about some of the history that has gotten us here. And also, which is most important, give us action items. What can I do as an individual? What can my family do? How can we help? And so it's important that you get everyone you know involved so they can be a part of the discussion. And here the discussion, I've received some inbox, some text messages on questions that you personally have. And I'm going to do my best to get through those questions tonight. So some of your questions can be answered as well. Thank you, Lakeisha, for logging in. Thank you, Renee. Hi, Stephen. Go ahead again, like, share, let us know that you're on. Say hello. Um, those that are watching on YouTube and Facebook, we're so grateful to have you on with us. Um, again, this is Acceleration Church. Tonight's conversation is a community conversation. Um, we wanted it to be very diverse. And so we have a diverse panel that's going to be sharing with us today, um, sharing their insights, their expertise. And again, most importantly, how do we go from here? What do we do? And we're titling this Justice for All. And so rather you're Black, White, Asian, Hispanic, we want you to be a part of the discussion because we are all God's children. Um, and with that being said, I posted today um, in my post, and I just felt this to post, um, as a church, when there's a hurricane, we respond. You know, um, our church has been through several hurricanes since we've started. And when there was a hurricane, we responded because as spiritual leaders, as people of faith, as um, God fearing people, as Christ followers, we want to be solutions. We want to be those that can help feed the hungry and those that are in distress. And so we responded um, once it was announced that we are a stay at home order, that kids were home with their families. We knew there were families that did not have enough food to feed all their children during the day. And so what did the church do? We responded. We made sure that we provided food. We fed over 300 families food so they can have nourishment. We provided resources and guided individuals on what to do during this time. And so yet again, our country needs us. There's a civil unrest. There's rioting in the streets. There's looting. There's people that are concerned, confused, and don't know how to feel. Um, and in the midst of a pandemic, we're dealing with pandemonium. So what do you do? Um, and one thing that we can't do is be silent. One thing that we can't do is just sit back and watch. We want to be a part of the solution. And so once again, our church is responding. If you are on and you're watching, you're a part of a church, you have a company. If you are a leader, I encourage you find a way to get the voice out there for those that may be the voiceless. And with that being said, I'm going to invite my first guest on who also um, is the pastor of Acceleration Church, my husband, um, Pastor Dio Pori, he and I pastor together. So I'm going to invite him on now with me. Hi, babe. What is going on, my love? You look absolutely fabulous as always. Thank you. And it's so funny because we're in the same house, but your lighting is better than mine. What happened? You know, the, the glory of God just sits on my life. 
Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted angels to, around me. <laughs> I wanted to have Pastor Dio on because I wanted to have a perspective uh, from a spiritual connotation, from a biblical connotation, but also um, Pastor Dio is also a businessman. And so I wanted him to talk from a corporate standpoint. Um, he and I both pastor Acceleration Church together. We tag team one Sunday. I may be speaking one Sunday. He may be speaking, um, but we both have a passion for our community. And so if you would just take a moment and introduce yourself. And also, if you can just answer for us, why is this topic important to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So once again, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm super excited that you are listening, that you're watching, whether you're watching live or watching on replay. Absolutely share this because we're hoping that amidst this discussion, uh, there'll be nuggets, there'll be strategies, systems, infrastructures that you perhaps can lend to your own environment, to your own social interactions uh, so that you can, of course, become become part of the solution as we're trying to be a part of the solution. Uh, you asked why, you know, why is this important to us? Um, why is it important to me specifically? I'll say this. Uh, nobody's immune to injustice. It's important to me because the reality is nobody is immune. It could hit my house. It has hit my house. And it would be irresponsible for me not to take into account, not just in this instance, but in any instance, looking at if there is a particular party who is not being favored and they're being treated differently than others, I need to pay attention to these things because again, nobody is immune from that. I'm raising a young boy who has to look at me and I'm a minority and I have dark complexion. I have a young girl who also looks like me, also has a certain skin complexion, a certain texture to the hair. And so then how do I explain to my children that because of the color of their skin and the texture of the hair, some people might feel either metaphorically or literally feel entitled to place their knee on their neck. It's a very difficult conversation to have. And so from a justice or injustice perspective, I need to be having this dialogue and wanting to be a part of the solution because I don't think anybody, especially, think about it this way. We are right now amidst one of the most difficult times this country has ever seen. We are amidst uh, corona. We have 40 million people who don't have a job. That in of itself is extremely difficult, very difficult to manage. People are spending more time inside the house than they ever before. And mm -hmm. yet now minorities also have to deal with the spread stress and pressure of dealing with racism and Rona. It has to be discussed and the solution has to come to surface. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Diane. We look forward to more of your advice, your answers, your insights. So thank you for and being here with me. us and for um, this platform and wanting to be a part of the solution. Next, I'm going to bring on um, our senator, um, Senator Randolph Bracey, who's joining us tonight. I'm so happy that he agreed. Um, a very busy, busy man um, going throughout the state representing our area. Um, where our church resides, where a lot of people that are watching reside. And in addition to being a senator over um, this particular precinct, you also represent the state as vice chair for community justice. So thank you so much. Um, and I just want to say this before you introduce yourselves, um, before you introduce yourself, I reached out to Senator Bracey. Um, and again, just trying to find solutions. What can we do? I need your help. And no, I mean, it was literally the same day he responded and said, I'll be there. And let me say this too, which you get major kudos for this. And I don't know about everybody else, but I know who I'm going for. So I'm just saying, but I asked this question to him and his assistant, because I'm always respectful. I said, are there any questions you want me to avoid? Because I know he's in the public light. He represents us. And his response was, no questions are off limits. So thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your transparency. And thank you for being with us tonight. So I've already kind of introduced you, but just give us a little bit more about yourself um, and why this is important to you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I uh, appreciate what you all are doing uh, in our community. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be on your show uh, today. Um, you know, um, so I, I'm Senator Randolph Bracey. I represent District 11, which is West Orange County. I've represented this 
area since 2016. And before that, uh, I was in the Florida House of Representatives. Um, I am the vice chair of the Criminal Justice Appropriation Committee. I was the criminal justice chairman where we developed criminal justice policy for the entire state. And it was in that role that I um, put forth all kinds of reforms, um, the likes of which we have not seen in the Florida legislature uh, probably ever. And so I was very proud of the work that we did, but, uh, but all of those reforms did not get to the final uh, destination in the at the governor's desk, but uh, we pushed the conversation, and so um, I, I'm, I'm proud of the work we we've done. But these I, I mentioned that I guess because we have to continue to push these reforms uh, because I think that's really what we want to see uh, in light of what has been happening in this country. So you know th this is very important to me. I'll just mention you know, why it's important to me. My daughter happened to, my seven-year-old daughter happened to see the uh, pictures or the video of of the, the murder, if wow. you will, of George Floyd. And she was so disturbed and, and, and crying. And so it sparked a conversation that was so uncomfortable to have, but, but, uh, but it, you know, I think it's just so important that, that we have to really come up with solutions because our community needs it. Absolutely. So, so thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. And next I'm going to bring on Will Holvoso, who is my partner in crime. Uh, Will and I travel the country training judges, training law enforcement, um, youth providers. We train on implicit bias and explicit bias. And Will is also a retired police officer. And I thought it was so important to have a very diverse dialogue and hear from someone that is in the trenches. Um, that is also a white male. And so, Will, I'm so happy that you are on. Let me tell you, Will has my back. He saw my post. He said, you go, girl. I got you. He shared my post, even if some people commented and did not like it. I said, Will, I need you on this panel. And he said, I'll be there. So thank you, Will, for being here and being a part of the solution, not just today. Um, you have definitely not been reactive, but proactive. You've been doing this work and bringing the light of some of the racial bias that we see in disproportionate minority contact, um, not just in Florida, but all around the country. And so I'm so thankful to have you on. And I just want to pause and let you introduce yourself and tell us why is this topic important to you? Absolutely. Thank you. And good evening, everybody. And thank you, Pastor Tacoa, uh, for allowing me to participate in tonight's event. So, uh, again, for, I do I do represent the law enforcement perspective, you know, but I also I think I, I I understand, you know, where law enforcement comes from sometimes. But I also I'm a big advocate of redefining our role, you know, in community expectations and police mm -hmm. legitimacy. And I think those issues are are important. And I think everything works together when we're talking about mental health or if we're talking about trauma or our history or procedural justice or, or restorative justice. Um, all this stuff is interrelated. And I think law enforcement, the role right now, quite frankly, I'm going to use the term patronizing a few times tonight because <laughs> I think it's real easy for us to kind of jump on board and, and talk about the murder of George Floyd, you know, and, and talk about yeah. how disgusted we are with it. But, but quite frankly, um, you know, we should have been having these conversations for, for months, years, and, you know, and for us just to kind of recycle, I think, some of these conversations, which is not what I'm part of. I'm part of having these discussions when things are good, when we think things are good and addressing, you know, some of the historic issues um, that have created some of the disparities that we see, especially in law enforcement. And law enforcement, although not fully responsible, is very complicit with what we see today in terms of the disparities going on around the country, uh, mostly with our black youth in our community mm -hmm. in Gainesville, Florida. It's uh, although we're 23 percent African-American, the youth that we arrest are 80 percent African-American. So obviously, mm -hmm. to, to me, that's um, that's uh, an indication that we can do better. And uh, I know you've heard me speak before and train before, but but I understand what law enforcement, where they're coming from. And I think it's a time that we sort of address, you know, this warrior versus guardian mentality. Yeah. And again, I think our role, law enforcement's role right now, as our country grieves and goes through anger and goes through sadness, our role is to just listen. We have to listen. And then we, we have to be part of these changes that have got to take place. And thank you for Very having good. me. 
Awesome. Thank you for being on. Thank you so much, Will. I'm going to come back to that guardian versus versus warrior theory and what that means. I, you know, we trained together, so I get it. But for those that are watching, I really want you to talk a little bit about that. But let me bring on our last panelist, Dr. Pamela, who is my mentor um, and has definitely been an advocate for diversity and inclusion, both as a professor and also as a program program director with the National Science Foundation. She is a bad sister. She's also a history maker. For those of you that don't know, Dr. Pamela is the first African-American to receive a doctoral degree in engineering in the state of Oklahoma. And I read her book. Her book is Winners Don't Quit. Today, they call me doctor. And in that book, she talks about a lot of the injustice and a lot of the um, things she had to deal with from a bias and racial standpoint because she was the only um, African-American woman to walk the path that she walked. So I thought it would be great to have you a part of this discussion. And I know the work that you're doing with the National Science Foundation at the federal level. So would you please just kind of introduce yourself and tell us why this topic is important to you. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Tacoa, for having me and Pastor Dio. You all are so near and dear to my heart. I'm so proud of what you're doing in the community with uh, Acceleration Church and just having the impact that you are. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a professor. Well, I was a professor at UCF for 27 years. Uh, and then for the last two year, two and a half years, I've been at the National Science Foundation as a program director for the Innovation Corps. And um, the, this is a program that transitions research from the academic environment into the marketplace. So basically creating businesses out of innovative ideas. And one of my goals when I went there was to see um, more underrepresented minorities gain access to these programs. Um, it's un unfortunate that only 1% of venture capital dollars go to underrepresented minority businesses, 1%. One percent. And, and you certainly you do have STEM professionals out there who are underrepresented minorities. Um, African-Americans are 11 percent of the workforce, but nine percent of the STEM professions. But it gets much smaller when you start looking at engineering disciplines, about two and a half percent. And that's where a lot of the innovation comes from. And so I was determined to do what I could to see that program, this powerful program that actually is your tax dollars um, that we get access to it in, in our communities. And so I've been largely focused on that for the last two and a half years. And uh, we've seen some significant change and, and some growth. Not enough, not enough, but do want to see more. Uh, and why is this conversation important to me? Anytime I see injustice, I'm disturbed. And I have been so disturbed by all that's going on lately. Well, frankly, what's all that's been going on in our country over the last um, few years and uh, the, in some cases, normalization of racism and hate and um, it's, it bothers me. It bothers me um, as a citizen. It bothers me as a, a Christian, and, but just a human being. Um, and so I am very, very pleased to be with you today because, you know, we, we have to talk about this. Um, and we can't sugarcoat it. it it's time to, to call it uh, what it is. And as disturbing as these images are, I only pray that a uh, positive, real movement, real change will result from these horrific um, acts that we just witnessed with um, Mr. Floyd's killing. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Pamela. And I want to dive right in because you brought it up injustice. Um, the backdrop of our conversation, it won't be the only topic because I believe that the George Floyd case is just a tip of the iceberg. Yes. But there are so many things that we're dealing with in our nation right now, from economic disparities to criminal justice disparities, racial bias, implicit bias, explicit bias, racism. Um, right. And so we're dealing with so much. But our backdrop for our conversation and what has encouraged this topic is the George Floyd incident. And the fact that the entire world and I, it breaks my heart, um, Senator Bracey, to hear that your seven year old daughter saw this um, someone with it with a knee on their neck. And, and what really frustrated me was to see the police officer with his hands in his pocket. Right. And so there was no care for his life, for a human being's life. And we, we put people in prison for that when you don't have respect for life. And right. so. 
to know that that person still went home and nothing happened until the the photo was or the video was released it bothered me but again regulating my emotions pastor i always say high emotions little logic and so because that's the backdrop of our conversation dr king um is known for a quote that says a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so you all come from different parts um, and we don't, none of us live in Minneapolis, but I thought it was important that we talk about this and we have seen the results of the threat of justice in Minneapolis, that it made people all over the world feel the injustice. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing some of the outcome. And so Senator Brace, I'm gonna start with you. As we talk about injustice, as we talk about the threat to justice, how, from your vantage point, is this case, this incident, a threat to justice, watching this man die um, the way that he did? Well, I just think that because there are rarely repercussions for actions like this, um, you know, there are some police that, that feel like they can act with impunity when it comes to black and brown people. And so mm -hmm. I think from a government perspective, we have to put in place um, some some repercussions for when when these kinds of actions take place. And so, uh, I've tried to do that. Those are part of the reforms I've talked about, but uh, those reforms have not been able to to uh, move forward. Uh, and, and so, but but I think we have to continue to talk about it and continue to push these reforms because I think that will really make the difference when, when, when police know that they cannot just kill someone, someone with impunity, then I think they'll think twice. And so uh, I, I think that's important. And, and, and as government leaders, uh, you know, I, I implore my colleagues to, to really um, look at how we reprimand law enforcement. We, we obviously support law enforcement, but we also have to protect people when there's injustice. And so, um, you know, I, I look forward to those discussions uh, when I come back to the legislature to say, hey, we have to deal with this. And but it, but it also, I think, is important for people to, to be engaged. Like, it's so good to see people protesting. Obviously, we don't support the vandalism, but, you know, I hope the same people stay engaged uh, in picking our leaders, our prosecutors, <laughs> Uh, our state representatives and senators, because these are the people that will actually. I lost your sound, Senator Bracey. Say something else. I lost your sound. So while his sound is coming back, Dr. Pamela, can you continue to speak on that? A threat to justice. How is this case a threat to justice everywhere? Oh, I definitely think a threat to justice everywhere when you have someone who is as bold as this officer was uh, and then the the lack of of responsiveness by the other three officers to say anything about it um and um, the the boldness when they knew they were being filmed and, and still continued uh, mm -hmm. and i think that what we're seeing here is a level of uh, lawlessness, I mean, and in this, not it's not just here. I mean, if we, there are a number of other things that have taken place, and we see the difference in how we're treated versus other folks. Think about the folks in Michigan when they were um, at the state house with with firearms, and I mean, these of course were not people of color, and so they were handled very differently than you would have than you would have probably been handled if they'd been um, African Americans. And I think what we're seeing is stark differences in the way that we as people of color are treated and this has to stop it absolutely has to stop because if we start to accept a little bit of it then it, then it continues and it grows and it grows and so i think that's what we're saying is that there have been so much tolerated so much i love the um the term when I, I was watching Van Jones on CNN and he said, it's not enough to say I'm not a racist. Uh, we have to be anti-racist. And so we have to say, and not only is it not okay, I am going to stand up against it. And so this is a true threat to justice. And I am so pleased. I, I don't at all support the looting and I shame on those folks that are looting and actually destroying property but i am so pleased and proud of the protesters that are out there and saying we will not accept this 
It is unacceptable. And we need to continue to do this and to make sure that our voices are heard. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Pamela. If you can tilt your camera down just a little bit so we can see your beautiful face. Thank you. Will, I want you to chime in on this. Um, as we talk about a threat to justice, and we know as law enforcement officers, that's our goal. That's your goal um, to protect and to serve and to uphold justice. So how, from your vantage point, would you see this case as a threat to justice? And so again, I, I full disclosure, sometimes I feel like I see things differently maybe than other officers. Okay. Well, obviously, you know, I'm always talking about that we are now and currently and have been, you know, um, we're defined by what happens around the country. We're no longer defined necessarily by what happens in our community. And so we need to be aware mm -hmm. that what happens in California or in Minnesota is a reflection upon us, you know, and that creates perceptions. And I think there's a lot of perceptions to go that you and I work on with people because those perceptions are officers realities. And mm -hmm. I think the killing of George Floyd confirmed what certain perceptions were going on in the black community. Right. And so I think that's something that was very powerful. When I first saw the video, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I felt as though it was a lynching. I felt as though it was mm -hmm. a lynching and it was it was perverted to the point that the killer was intoxicated with the power. Of, of listening to people beg for mercy. And the other yes. officers really acted as the mob that protected that lynching to take place. And also, I also will hear about bad apples in law enforcement. I also will hear about this is a one-off, you know, it doesn't happen. And, and I, you know, I, there's a lot of credibility. There's a lot of uh, examples of officers doing fantastic work in the community. I, I get that, but I also would challenge the notion that what are the chances that four senior officers all showed up on the same call that were, you know, untrained and unprofessional and unsympathetic and had no humanity and participated in that killing. So I just would have to ask you, you know, we typically will ask an officer, you know, what would you have done? But I think the challenge from the community, like I said at the beginning, we have to listen. Sometimes law enforcement tends to tell you why we do what we do and we don't open up our ears to listen to what our expectations are. So that's kind of my uh, uh, perspective of what I saw when I saw the video and I didn't see all nine minutes of it, but the, the little pieces that I saw of it. So that's, that's got a, um, a resounding effect, I think on, on people's perceptions, you know, that, that, that we work on, you know, through our dialogues, you know, and, and through our implicit bias training as well. So I think that's a, an important, and it's just not just a challenge. Law enforcement is on the forefront right now, but all those institutions that surround the criminal justice system have got to be challenged and they've got to yeah. be reworked, reorganized. And, yeah. and all of our roles have got to be redefined. You know, yeah. and like I like to, to talk about, you and I work with youth most of the time, is that probation officers and judges and state attorneys and cops, we don't make good surrogate parents. You know, no. people need to be parents, right? Yeah. And we need to do what's best for those youth. And I think locking kids up in jails and using that sort of the consequences through as, as discipline is absolutely unequivocally wrong. And so one of the things that I always advocate for is to stop arresting kids. So very good. Let me ask you this. Will you touched on a couple of things? I love that you said that officers have to be mindful that the perception of what they do on one area can be reflected all over. And I remember doing a training at the Orange County Sheriff's Office and one of the police officers said that, you know, someone came up to him and said, I hate what y'all did in Ferguson. And he was like, no, I live in Orlando. <laughs> but but, you know, when one when we see one, we sometimes tend to to treat all the same. And that's where bias come in, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But one of the questions came up for you, Will, as you were talking is in the in a civilian world where you have three officers watching this other officer kill someone, if they were civilians, would all of them have been arrested? Yes. Okay. The Absolutely. other question, go now, ahead. Let me just add to that. So I think one of the benefits, I mean, I think he should have been arrested immediately, obviously, if it was two civilians in a road rage incident or somebody did that to somebody else. I mean, obviously, he would have some defenses that he could use down the road. But at the end of the day, don't forget, what we haven't seen now are the reports that the officers wrote reflecting what exactly happened. And I think the killer of George Floyd also wrote a report. So that can be used to because it's not going to be consistent with what we saw. No. So just like in the Laquan McDonald case, Several officers were fired and it helped prosecuting that officer, too, because of what they wrote in the reports. Yeah. Right. And so I think that's a, a really bit of an advantage for the uh, prosecuting attorney to have that information. 
Very good. Thank you so much. And Dahlia, I'm going to come to you to, to chime in about a first suggestion. But before I do, because Senator Bracey, you got cut off on us. It was something that um, Will just brought up and I want to I want to point back to you. He said it's beyond just the officers, but we got to get into the system and see change. And you mentioned earlier that when you were the chair um, of the subcommittee for criminal justice for the state of Florida, that there were some reforms that you wanted to put in place, but they didn't get um, voted through. So talk to us a little bit about that and what happened. Why did they not come to fruition and what can we do to help you um, as this well, is presented again? Um, I'll just say that law enforcement has a tremendous effect on certain legislators in certain parts of the county uh, and parts of our state. And so you would get uh, law enforcement, for an example, uh, drug sentencing laws, uh, mandatory minimums. So uh -huh. you have depending on certain amounts of drugs a person may possess, you know, if it reaches a certain threshold, they'll get 15 years. Well, you'll get uh, law enforcement that will come to Tallahassee and lobby against uh, wow. getting rid of those minimum, minimums. And so it has tremendous effect on certain legislators because if it they're shown not to be supporting law enforcement, then they can get unelected. And so it's, it's, it's a political game also. And so we were able, because I was a chair, I was able to pass it. And a lot of these reforms moved through the Senate. The House is, uh, uh, is much more conservative. Um, and, and law enforcement has a lot more power in that chamber. And so even though we pass it in one chamber, we couldn't pass it in, in another chamber. And so there, there's still this rhetoric of being tough on crime um, and, and the like. So that's one of the reasons why we couldn't move some of these um reforms forward okay okay thank you dio pastor dio can you speak on that threat to justice and how this case um shows that or plays a part in that yeah absolutely i think that it's it, it legitimately is a threat um to justice i think that when a system targets a certain group of people and it can potentially treat that group or population or ethnicity or what have you uh, differently than what it would treat others, then at that moment, it absolutely becomes a threat to our justice, right? Because justice, in other words, should be blind. Uh, and I think there's something, if, if I can peel this onion back a bit more, I think the real danger and how this threatens injustice is the social validation that can take place if nothing is done. Mm -hmm. The social validation, in other words, of this is acceptable and okay. See, it's 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 fine until it hits your house, and the moment it hits your house, then now it becomes an issue to address. And so, if we allow this to be socially accepted that a police officer can treat a black man this way then the masses begin to understand and interpret that this is the way things go. Let me expound on that a bit more. Uh, the very same week we saw the circumstances and situation with Amy Cooper. With Amy Cooper, we were able to see her response, how she reacted in the park. With her comment of, hey, I'm going to call the cops and tell them that there's an African-American man specifically begins to tell us what her perspective, what her view of who she is and how her whiteness can overcome or rather determine the outcome of a black person. I, it, it tells us her perspective of her and the police and what police mean to her, social validation, because it's happened over a long period of time. So what police and, and her whiteness mean, it also goes to show what police and the black person means socially validated well i'm going to call the cops and tell them that specifically there's an african-american man threatening me again there's been a social there's an acceptance that has happened because of the systemic issue over the period of time that people again socially accepting this now begin to take on this characteristics and would threaten other people based on the uniform being in their favor and that is how, in my opinion, it becomes a massive threat to justice. And it all goes down to how frequently this happens 
in how much we would allow it to take place as a culture and as a society. And so that brings up bias um, as you're as you're describing what took place in the park. And, and like you said, when she called, it was it's a black man, um, not just as a man, not that it's someone, but specifically it's a black man. And a lot of times we hear black when we hear African-American, when we hear Hispanic, there is a different response than if it's someone else. And, you know, um, I train and I didn't introduce myself. I'm pastor of Acceleration Church. I'm also a trainer. Um, on implicit and explicit bias and have been doing so for almost a decade. And so we learn an implicit bias that there's some unconsciousness that we have automatically um, that, you know, if I describe a car, if I say there's a car that's a big pickup truck with the Confederate flag in the back, tell me how the driver looks. You know, most we're going to say, oh, he's a white male. He's a redneck. If I say there's a hoopty with big rims and loud music, tell me how the driver looks. You're going to say he's either you know, Mexican or or black. And so we have these preconceived notions of people when we see their their external and we group them as though this person is just like they're this person where everybody is individual. And so bias comes up um, and that's a word that we've been hearing and it may be a trendy word now, but it's something that we've studied for some time. And um, I talked about this the other day, Harvard University did an in-depth study. They have a white paper beyond that, beyond their research. They have a free test. I encourage everybody that's watching, go to harvard.edu after this segment. Don't leave now. Uh, but when this is over, go to harvard.edu and take the free test. It will surprise you the biases that you have. And I got to throw this in for good measure. White people are not the only one with biases. Black people have biases too. Hispanics, age, we all have them. Um, there's a book by Carter G. Woodson. Um, it's titled The Miseducation of a Negro. And in his book, he talks about how he surveyed African-American people. And this was during the time of right when segregation and all those things. So, so there was a lot of unrest in, in our society. And he surveyed African-American people. He said, if you have a heart disease and you have to have a heart transplant, meaning your heart has to be taken out of your body and a new heart put in, would you want a white cardiologist or a black cardiologist? And over 90% said white. Right. Because over time, society, media experiences has told us that black is inferior and white is better. And so the biases, even for our own race, it exists. And so we got to talk about it and we have to find out how do we dig deep into the surface and get rid of those biases and stop letting them be pep um, preparated, um, shown out even in media, television and entertainment. And so with that being said, do either of you feel that bias played a part in the George Floyd case? Absolutely. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, I can I can speak and, and I guess kick that off uh, in terms of that question, because uh, it, again, going back to your point, Takoa, what is a bias? A bias is a wrong and error in how one thinks and processes information that's coming to us. Um, it is an erroneous way. And the reason why we have biases, right, is because we have a brain that has limited resources. And so our brain naturally is going to, if it's a terms of attention, we only have a select amount of attention that we can give to something. So immediately our mind is going to process as fast as it can to make a decision based on the information that we might have. The same thing also goes with our memory. Our memory is limited, limited capacity. And so then as a shortcut, our minds will go ahead and produce a bias. It would go ahead and base decisions based off of certain information that we have. And so in this particular instance, I think has a huge uh, uh, thing to play. You already mentioned on one of them, which was it is perceived that the uh, in a black person would have more strength, right? You've mentioned this before in your in your take interview, which I thought you can take more pain, right? Uh, so I, I won't touch on that, but I absolutely agree with that bias. There's also a, a bias that is called confirmation bias. A confirmation bias is where we're looking for a piece of information that would validate what we believe. So essentially, let's say if I'm uh, if I'm for gun control, right? Um, the moment that I see somebody has been uh, murdered or killed because someone had a gun in their hand, to me, I'm like I'm going to think of that moment as that's that's exactly what it is. It's happening because this is just wrong. 
I'm using this moment to confirm my already existing belief system. Whereas mm -hmm. if I was on the opposing side and I'm for guns and the same incident happened, my approach and my, my bias is going to be, uh, this happened because of whatever other reason that supports why guns should be okay. It's a confirmation bias. And I think in this particular instance, specifically with George, th there's a, I believe a confirmation bias in the sense of, okay, um, if George pushed back even the slightest, there could be a confirmation bias that immediately kicks in in the police officer to say, I need to show more restraint because I understand that they, black people, can, can take on more pain. And so immediately he'll begin to apply more strength. Then there's also another uh, bias that's called the availability heuristic bias. Availability heuristic bias is, uh, the more we see something, the more it's validating how we believe. So if the media is constantly feeding us that a black person who is 6'3 is an angry and strong and dangerous person, mm -hmm. then immediately at the moment that I encounter this individual and something happens to where it triggers my availability heuristic, right? I begin to now act out according to what I'm remembering, the credence, the credibility is, this person is dangerous because they're tall and they're black. Yeah. And I believe that those were biases that easily stood in in this instance and caused this thing to take place. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in about bias? Did you, do you feel bias played a part in this? Oh, clearly. I mean, um, bias is a, a form of prejudice, whether it's prejudice for or, or um, prejudging, if you will, that's essentially what prejudice is. Um, and some people benefit from bias. These, um, sometimes we t tend to think that certain groups are smarter than others. So a particular uh, some in engineering and technology, oftentimes it's uh, easier for an Asian uh, innovator to get funding than an, uh, much easier than an Asian than an African-American to uh, secure VC funding or other type of funding. So clearly there was bias at work here as it relates to um, uh, George Floyd's situation. And you uh, got, what, four white officers and, and one black man, and they all felt that it was it was necessary to have this amount of force on one person and, and then not even taking action when you he was clearly um, suffering. And I, it's, I don't know if it's that they don't think African-Americans are humans. You know, historically in this country, at one point, we were considered three-fifths of a human. So uh, some of that, unfortunately, still lingers in, in the uh, minds of, of some of these folks. And so I think there's clearly bias involved in this situation. Thank you. Anyone else? Want to tackle hey, that bias? Hey, to go, Will. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I I agree too, and I think you know again the the law enforcement side that we that we train on a lot of times. Um, I'm gonna talk about two issues. One is um, the bias part uh, first and foremost. So we respond to a call and we get a limited amount of information. So somebody brought up the Amy Cooper situation, right? That's a classic example of an officer responding now to a call and they've now inherited Amy's bias. And so the officer shows up and has, you know, it, like in Philadelphia at the Starbucks. So the officer shows up and has now the manager's bias who felt like they had two people lingering that were African-American in her store. So that's a challenge for law enforcement. And we have to recognize that we only have our own biases that we show up at. And, but we also have the caller's bias as well. And I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pivot off the, the George Floyd yeah. one. I'm going to go back to George Floyd. But I, I, I agree with um, the lady that talked about, uh, the doctor that talked about um, the, the historic um, bias that we bring to the calls. On a call screen, if it's a domestic and it's in one of our more marginalized neighborhoods, we will start to fill in the blanks, right, from law mm -hmm. enforcement. We start to fill in, okay, we're going to arrest somebody, we're going to take them to jail because that's what they want. So, I mean, we do bring biases uh, to the job, our own stereotypes that usually will come out, you know, under pressure. But in this case, um, I, I think bias was a big factor and how they treated, how George was treated from the very call. Because, again, that should have been a call to me that could have been just a report written or a citation right. issued right. and didn't necessitate an arrest. And, again, I think right. we go back to looking at policies, looking at legislation, why people need to be arrested. What we discovered in Gainesville is that we can arrest less people and still have crime rates go down. 
because those are some of the things that we're measured on. And that's some of the things that we have to be accountable for. But I think uh, in, in that case, uh, I, I agree that I think bias played a, a big role uh, in, in the in, in the murder of, of George Floyd. OK, thank you. I'll, I'll Go just, ahead, Senator. I'll just add to some of the comments that were made earlier. I mean, there, there are biases toward African-American men. Um, there, there are certain thoughts when you think about African-American men, especially, uh, I believe, George uh, 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 Floyd was tall. Uh, there's just certain biases that have been uh, in our subconscious subconscious mind for, for a very long time. And so uh, those biases play a part when, when you talk about law enforcement interaction uh, with African-American men. And I think it shows up. Yeah, and I say this with biases, um, and I'm, I'm happy this is an education form because I want people to get educated on this information. Um, even as I talk about implicit bias and explicit bias, I've had tons of people reach out to me and want to know more. And so I just want to pause for a moment just to provide a little bit of opportunity for people to educate themselves and provide solutions. Um, and I'm going to pull on you, um, Dayu and Dr. Pamela, because I have you all on here from a business perspective as well. Um, bias is something that takes place over time. It's unconscious. And again, you can receive bias through watching the media. You can receive bias through music you hear. You can even receive bias from just history, what people have said about a group of people over time. Bias can also be adopted through jokes. You know, what is funny and, and you laugh about it when it's really not the case. But because you hear the jokes over time, then you begin to subconsciously think that this is the truth of the matter. So we know that we all have biases. We all have implicit bias. And that's why I want everyone that can to take that test. But explicit bias is when we act out on those biases. And so I'll give you a little example. And Will, you've heard me use this as a scenario before. Um, let's say, you know, for me, I broke my nail um, and I needed to go to a nail salon. My nearest nail, the nearest nail salon to me, I had not been to before. So before I opened the door of the nail salon, my unconscious bias, my implicit bias told me who would be on the other side of the door. Anyone can guess what 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 race of people that I think would be in the in the nail salon. Asian, Korean. Asian, 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 Vietnamese. OK, so when I opened the door. At the reception desk was an Asian man, was a Vietnamese man. And I said, I broke my nail, don't have an appointment. Do you have someone that can fix it really quick? He said, sure, go to table number three. I went to table number three to my surprise. Wow, it was a Caucasian woman. I looked around, I saw a Hispanic woman. I saw an Asian woman. I said, this is a very diverse nail salon. I proceeded for her to repair my nail. Great job, end of story. Take that same scenario. In that scenario I just gave, there was implicit bias. I had unconsciously believed, based on my experience, that the type of people that do nails are Vietnamese Asian people. Same scenario. Here's where explicit bias comes in. It's about the outcome. Same nail salon. I walk in before I open the door. Hmm, it's going to be Asians and Vietnamese. I go to the reception desk. Asian man, he says, go to table number three. I go to table number three. It's a white lady ready to do my nail. I then pause and say, oh, thank you so much. I'll wait for the other nail tech to get my nail done. And then I go and I wait for the Asian woman to fix my nail because I've now acted out on my bias that tells me only Asian people can do nails. And so that's implicit, but then explicit is the outcome. I use that story in my training because it's palatable. You take that same scenario, you put it in a doctor's office. Take that same scenario and put it in a corporate setting. And you look at resumes and you say, oh, I don't want this person because they're African-American or they're Hispanic. They're, they won't do the job like a white person. That's when we see explicit bias in place. When you take that unconsciousness and you then provide outcomes based on that. And so I want to talk tonight for everybody that's watching. You have biases. Admit it. If we go around and we say, oh, we're colorblind. That's not true. We will not get to a solution if we don't admit there is a problem. We are not colorblind. We see color very well. But it's what we do when we see it. And so one of the things that I often say is if we're going to see bias begin to decrease, we have to diversify. We have to include. 
Right. I teach my children to have friends of all races. My son has a white friend. My daughter has an Asian friend and they have black friends and they have Spanish. Like I want them to be diverse because it would tear down the walls right. that society would tell them about a group of people. They have to learn for themselves who that individual is. Mm -hmm. If you're watching and you own a business or you are in a position of leadership, ask yourself who's at the top of the table. Who's on the executive team at the company I work for? Do any of them look like you? Beyonce, she had a contract, and I don't want to call out the shoe companies. I don't, I don't want anybody um, to think I'm bashing a shoe company. But she went and she was going to work with the shoe company. And she said when she walked into the boardroom, no one in the company mm -hmm. looked like her. Yep. And she said, I'm sorry, you can't design for the people that follow me because nobody looks like me. She didn't say I can't work with Caucasian people, but can you mix it a little bit? Can we have some diversity? And so if we're going to see change and we're going to hone in on these biases. We got to begin to have diversity and inclusion. Who comes to your house for the holidays? Who do you invite over for the barbecues? Who do you ask out to lunch on your lunch break at work? If they look like you, do something different. I know we are stay at home, but when we get back to work, begin to do things differently. Yes. Who is your friends? Who's in your circle? Do they all look like you? Are they all men? Or do you have some women? Are they all Christians? Or do you associate with Jews? Are they all black? Or do you have Caucasian friends? The more that we diversify, the more these walls will come down and we will realize we're all the same. And so I want us to talk about that. Dio, Dr. Pamela, talk to me from a business perspective. How can we help corporate America to realize that every CEO does not have to be a white male to succeed? How do we get more chiefs? How do we get more senior leadership, more directors, more executives that is diverse and that looks like the people that buy the products? Right. Well, there's definitely a business case for diversity. I mean, it's been shown consistently that the more diverse an organization and, and even with more diverse boards, that you t tend to increase your profitability of an organization. And so I, I, I like to think that business leaders are starting to understand that. Um, that universities are starting to understand that as well. Um, but I, um, I'm i hopeful that we'll also start to see it because, you know, in the seats, we, you still have such a, a small number of underrepresented minorities. But I think the, the smarter companies are starting to realize that if they want to influence the market and, and access get access to certain market share, that it's imperative that they have people of color uh, that they have women who are, and they ha also understand what the gen different generational needs are. So uh, diversity is not just a good idea. It, it's uh, it makes good economic sense. And I think one of the other important things that we need to realize as a nation, when we leave certain people out, not only are you from a corporate standpoint, uh, uh, handicapping your corporation, but even as a nation, when we leave certain people out, those are innovators, thought could be thought leaders that solving many of the problems that impact our, our, our society, our country, and even the global community. So really being aggressive about bringing those people to the table. table. And stop in, uh, when you're interviewing or hiring, stop going to the same places. You, we, I, I get tired, of, I, I get irritated when I, well, we couldn't find any minorities. That's not true. That is just a good look. Um, and so I recently accepted a position as associate dean for academic programs at North Carolina State University, Wilson College of Textiles. And a big part of the reason I accepted this position is because I see such a true and dedicated emphasis to diversity and inclusion in this space. And my heart is really um, very much in the academic world because I think there we have an opportunity to have a lot of influence by working with, with students as they're getting educated also uh, and in a leadership position, an opportunity to impact some of the policy and the decisions that are made. But we absolutely must embrace everything that you just said, Tacoa, about truly diversifying our homes, our organizations, our universities, and our leadership. Very good. Thank you. Dio? <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that uh, Dr. Pamela was extremely thorough in her response. And I think that you also hit on some extremely valuable things when it comes to diversity. At the end of the day, just to reiterate, it is statistically uh, proven 
that mm -hmm. a organization that has diversity within their teams are able to solve problems faster. Absolutely. It is shown that these companies that have diverse teams are able to overcome and resolve conflict in teams faster. There is no question, if you are a achieving company, you're going to encounter some challenges, some hurdles. There's always going to be some trip ups on the way to the playoffs. Every team encounters it. And the more diverse this team is, the more uh, the probability of you overcoming and having your team overcome the situation faster has a huge reliance on how diverse this team is. At the end of the day, every business is in business to increase shareholder value. Right, uh, you increase shareholder whether you're uh, a small business, you yourself are the shareholder, and you yourself want to make more money and want to create more legacy and want to create bigger profits. If you are a public entity, meaning trading on the stock market, your number one responsibility as a CEO is to drive shareholder value up, or you will be replaced and fired because you were not able to satisfy or satiate the appetite of your shareholders who are investing in your company. So at the end of the day, once again, it's if I'm driving shareholder value and with a diverse team, I'm able to get different perspectives on how to solve and innovate, then I can reach more people. Why would I limit myself to a certain demographic or a certain mindset or a certain perspective if indeed, again, my end objective is to maximize profits, increase shareholder value? So from a corporation perspective, you absolutely should have a diverse workforce so that you can innovate and and produce and create the kind of teams that would legitimately uh, drive customer satisfaction. Thank you. And that's that's from a business perspective. I want to now talk to Senator Bracian and Will um, from a criminal justice perspective. Um, we see that African-Americans and Hispanics make up about 36 percent of the population but over 60% of the prison population. Why are there so much disparities? Is it only black people committing crimes? Talk to me. Well, there's just disparities in every part of our criminal justice system. If you talk about arrest, uh, you can get the same crime, but uh, an African-American uh, is arrested more, more uh, they're more likely to be arrested for the same crime. Uh, when you look at sentencing, you will get African Americans, the same crime will be sentenced to a longer period of time. Um, th th I mean, this this is pervasive throughout our entire criminal justice system. And so, you know, we, we need a complete overhaul of our, our criminal justice system. Uh, we, we need to look at different parts of it and, and, and we need to go step by step. And that's that's what I try to do in my political career, and it's been a, 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 a slow process. But um, we we have we have uh, too many disparities in our criminal justice system, um, to say the least. How can we change that? What can we do? Well, um, as civilians, what can we do as citizens, as taxpayers, as mothers, as parents? What can we do? Well, you know, I, I go back to voting and electing uh, your leaders that represent you. Uh, I, I think that's really where the change will happen. You know, if, if you don't see what you want to see happening in your state government or your city government, you need to be engaged to uh, elect the right people. And so uh, too many people aren't. But, but, I, but I do think that uh, people are starting to be engaged and starting to pay attention to what's going on. And I hope that uh, the incidences that have happened recently uh, will spark people to get engaged. I mean, that, that's that's really how I think you make change. There are people that have come to Tallahassee. You've come to Tallahassee mm -hmm. to lobby your legislator. Uh, that has an effect. Uh, email, call, uh, go see your uh, representatives and let them know what's going on in your community, your thoughts. Uh, I would just say be engaged, be involved, and, and that's how uh, you make an impact on the lawmaking process. 
Very good. And let me ask you this question before I pivot to Will. What about leadership? Do we need more more diversity from a political standpoint? Do we need more brown and black people running for office or more qualified people or more passionate people or people that are not just following the dollar? Absolutely. Um, I, I do think we need uh, more diversity in, in our political leadership. I, I think, for an example, our pr prosecutors, when we talk about the criminal justice system, they have tremendous power. Mm -hmm. And so you're starting to see these uh, um, prosecutors that are a little bit more reform minded. And, and so I, I think that we need to be paying attention to these kinds of races and the candidates that run in them and, and, and uh, elect the right ones. And so I, I do believe that we need more diversity. I think it's happening, but also, you know, not just in the seats that are considered a black seat. I mean, we need um, we need people to run in different places. And, you know, I live in the city of Okoe, and you know, just for the first time in 2018, we got a our first black commission city commissioner, and then yeah. the next year we got a second one. I mean, that's just a small example, but I would just say not in your your uh, typical uh, political positions. But we need to look at different places that people can run or different positions and and, and run people there so very good thank you and, and let me ask you this senator brace for those that may be watching and want to get into politics what was your journey how did you get into it what were the steps you took i got involved by working on uh, other people's campaigns and that's how that was my entryway and and uh, I just worked on, uh, I remember working on, on Mayor Dyer's campaign years ago, and uh, my mother ran for office. I ran her campaign, and I really enjoyed uh, being engaged in the political process. And from there, that, that, that's how I got involved. And so uh, I did some community work, some mentoring of some young kids, and so that kind of developed a passion to just work with my community and make a change. But specifically about politics, uh, campaigning, someone that you, you believe in, uh, that, that's a good way to get involved. Very good, thank you. And then Will, the original question, Hispanics, African-Americans make up 36% of the population, but over 60% of the prison population. Is it just black people committing crime? What are you saying? Or what did you see when you were in law enforcement? Yeah, so a uh, great question to Koa. And I, uh, I'm not hearing the senator, and I'm not sure why, but I, I see that he's talking. So um, I, I'm, um, I don't know if I'm prevented, muted from hearing him, but I can hear everybody else clearly. So I just, uh, I'm not really okay. sure what he said, um, but I'll try to follow up. Yeah. So back to the original question, and I want to answer two questions actually. So one is when we train police officers, one of the things that I always like to ask, and it depends on where I'm at, uh, minorities. Um, in Florida are African-Americans and Hispanic, black and brown. So minorities uh -huh. somewhere else uh, might be Native Americans, might be somebody else. So I always want to look at the, the numbers, the data to see what exactly is going on in those communities. And so I always pose the question, like in Alachua County, for instance, is, is, is to the officers is why are you arresting so many African-American youth? And, and then so I think that that question itself, I think, goes to uh, allowing the officers to kind of say, well, we arrest uh, black youth because uh, their families don't know how to raise them, you know? So I know that's an ignorant response, but that's what they'll mm -hmm. say sometimes. And they'll say, well, why don't their families know how to raise them? Well, their father's not in it. Well, why is their father not in it? So you can explore that sort of conversation as you look at the histories of the communities that you are policing and those communities that you have inherited, but may not have created. And I think that's an important piece for officers to understand what communities they're policing and why they're policing. And I think just as important for teachers to understand why some of the, the children that they're teaching are struggling with certain academic areas, right? And so I think it's important to understand the neighborhoods and the poverty, especially um, with the demographics that you're, that you're policing. And I think you've heard me say this before that, that people just don't wake up and decide, man, I wanna live in section eight housing. You know, I want my daughter to be pregnant. I want to be unemployed, uneducated, my kid in a gang, right? And I'm not saying that about everybody, but that's typically some of the officers have those biases when they go into those neighborhoods. And so I always wanted to sort of flush out and explore from the officer's perspective, why are, you know, 70, 60% from your statistics of, of black youth, you know, 
uh, getting arrested? And I think that's a fair question to begin that conversation, I think, to really understand your community. So the second now, let, part. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, the go second ahead. Part, you were talking about um, d demographics. You were talking about some hiring practices I heard um, uh, on this just earlier, but I want to talk about from the law enforcement. Okay. So, so really we're, we're, we're behind. I think a lot of companies, I think private companies as well are well behind. It wasn't, you know, when I got here in 84, you know, I worked with the first African-American police officer at the Gainesville police department. And then that was only, you know, 35, 40 years ago. That really wasn't that long ago, you know, to understand really incorporating African-Americans and minorities into, I think, law enforcement is a big piece of it. And where I think we've evolved to, um, if I had my agency, you know, and I was the chief or the, the sheriff, I, you definitely have to have your command staff, your command structure has got to reflect the demographics of your community. And I think for a number of reasons. One, I believe that that it just allows fo folks to believe, oh, man, I can accomplish that. I can be a captain. I can be a lieutenant. You know, but at the same time, when your agency does come uh, under a situation where now they're being looked at, you know, you have to reflect uh, a, a positive um, representation of your community. Now, that being said, I, I don't believe necessarily that an officer that works in one of our marginalized African-American community needs to be African-American. Now, some people do. Some people will suggest, well, we need more African-Americans that probably look like us. I, I believe, from my experience, you know, is that if you care about people, if you care about the citizens that you serve and you treat them with dignity and respect and don't show bias and they trust you, I don't care if you're white or black or Hispanic, your ethnicity, I don't care if you're LGBT, it doesn't matter. And and for people to suggest that African-Americans have got to serve African-American communities, that gives white people a pass. Oh, OK, yeah. well, I guess I don't have to be courteous, you know, no expectations of me in that neighborhood. So in all fairness, it may not be what everybody agrees with but that's my perspective so, yeah. so i wanted to talk about the law enforcement sort of lens when yeah. you talk about uh, demographics and representation and i appreciate that that's why i have you on so thank you for giving us that law enforcement lens i'm going to ask you more specifically if if you can do you have you seen in your years of law enforcement where white police officers seems intimidated when they go into a black area or have fear if they are called into a quote unquote black part of town or a minority um, populated area? They're scared. Sure, they're scared. Yeah, so they go in and they're scared. But I've also seen some white officers that thrive you know, that do that provide their best service in those in those um, communities, you know, that, that that that, you know, and again, getting into high crime areas and stuff like that. Again, that's semantics. I'm, I'm not really buying into that kind of stuff. I think yeah. communities that call you more are communities that trust you. When communities stop calling you, uh, you become atomized. And, and that's when you have to start worrying. Right. So that's so I'm a big believer that that shouldn't be a reflection of crime. That should be a reflection of trust. But yeah, absolutely. So I think that's a that's an important piece. And I think when you get someone that's a Caucasian that comes into a community that they're not familiar with, and then they have to police neighborhoods and cultures that they're not familiar with to go up, I think it definitely does scare them. Yes. And with that, and I got a question for you on here before I jump into that question. And I know you know, and I know some of the answers to this because you and I work together. But are there diversity training or, or sensitivity training or culture training for law enforcement that you are aware of that is like mandatory when you go into the police academy, you have to take this class? OK, so that's a, a, a you know, a, if we're looking to really change the culture, you know, a real paradigm shift in law enforcement, I think what's taught at the academy needs to be heavily reviewed. And I think, you know, when you're looking at a seven month academy, when if you wanted to be a barber and cut hair, you got to go to school for 11 months. I think that needs to be revisited. So I'm a, I, I believe there's a lot of pieces, I think, in the law enforcement training and, and seven months to walk out and put that uniform on and wear that badge. You know, it shouldn't entitle you to respect from the community. You know, that's got to be earned. But I think I there's it. this idea, this false notion that just because I have this uniform on that people are going to respect me and listen to me. Right. So. Um, so the academy is just an excellent place. And yes, I've seen a lot of curriculums on diversity. I've seen a lot of um, uh, a curriculums on, on a variety of, of training that I've been through in 30 years. Um, I don't think there's anything that's been consistent, I think, enough. And, and again, those conversations, when you're having a training with law enforcement, the community needs to be part of that training. 
Now, when you're talking about a tactical approach with your SWAT team entering a school, okay, maybe the community doesn't need to be there. But as far as the rest of the training goes, mm -hmm. Tacoa, the community needs to be there and yeah. give us their input. Absolutely. And I must say, Will has been on the forefront with that, with our trainings. Our trainings for implicit bias and disproportionate minority contact used to be all police. And then in the studies and the research that we did, we needed to involve community partners, principals, teachers, because it takes an entire village. So thank you for that, Will. And I want to pivot um, to you, Senator Bracey. He said something. I love it. Seven months is not long enough. More training is needed for police officers, especially if you're giving them the right to take a life, if you're giving them a deadly weapon, if you're now introducing them into our community. And I've always said this based on just my interactions and the studies I've done and the work I've done. There's police officers who have never been in a black community. They grew up in an all white community, all white school, and their perception of African-American Hispanics have not come from interaction. It's come from television, which we all know has a large disparity of how they represent us. So what can we do? Is there something that you can do, something that we can do to 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 lobby, to reach out, to ask for some changes or a task force or somebody to look into what is currently being done from an education perspective and what can we do to change that? Thank you for the question. So our local uh, uh, police, um, Orange County sheriffs, for example, uh, Orlando police, they can adopt their own policies as regarding training that they can add more training to what they already have. But I, I just wanted to mention, and, and I would like to hear the sheriff's perspective. You know, I remember a couple of years ago where we were, uh, there was a bill to require body cams and mm -hmm there was some pushback from law enforcement and you know whenever there's uh some accountability measures to be put on uh law enforcement there's usually pushback and you know there there's certain uh localities that are better than others but uh as a whole the the law enforcement community usually will push back on, on some of these accountability measures and so uh it makes it difficult to impose these new laws on law enforcement when uh, when they lobby against them, but but I would say that uh, we can speak to our local sheriff to adopt some of these uh, training measures, and, and and I think we would do so, and and that's something I'm going to look into uh, regarding a statewide policy. But I, I've been down this road before with certain policies. That, uh, that 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 usually there's usually pushback. Yeah, and I must give a shout out to Orange County Sheriff, um, previous sheriff, which he's now our mayor, Jerry Demings. Uh, when he was a sheriff, I was a part of his task force, and for six consecutive years, he mandated or or required. I don't want to say mandated, required for all of his school resource officers to be trained on disproportionate minority contact. And I was one of those trainers. Um, and we even, but one of the things that they dealt with this funding. Everyone doesn't have the money to pay for those trainings. So I took it upon myself to write a grant. And thankfully we received the grant and that grant paid for six years of training. And so I do wanna say as a citizen, there's things that we can do. You can write for grants, you can meet with your sheriff. You can go to Tallahassee as um, Senator Brace has said, I've been to Tallahassee, I've marched. Someone commented, you know, why are we here talking? Why aren't we out marching? But all of us, have been a part of protests and march and lobbying. And I believe that protesting is one component, but there's many other things that we can do. And I've really been trying to focus on systematic approach. What can we do so that we can truly see change? And so you're right, Orange County has not had some of the things we've seen in other cities because of those trainees, because of a sheriff that was concerned about the diversity in the community. Um, so I think that's very important. Thank you so much, Senator Bracey. I have a specific question for you, Will. We have about 15 more minutes, um, but I have a question for you, Will. It says, um, uh, this person says, I have a question. I've never seen when one officer is aggressive that the other officer step in and say, this is not needed or stop. What they normally see is that multiple police officers jump in. And so their question is, are there any training in place on how to de-escalate when it's a coworker or fellow officer? Again, I know the answer, but I want you to touch on it. <laughs> That's a great question. 
it, it's what I was also thinking about as well, because we have begun some of the de-escalation training, you know, some of the verbal judo, you know, and so we've been working on some of those. There's not a solid curriculum for that as of yet that I've experienced, but I've been through a few of them. Um, and then I was looking at that exact same scenario myself thinking, man, that is a great training scenario to allow officers because sometimes in law enforcement, you'll have a more senior officer and I don't want to call him a bully officer, but he might, you know, when he does something, people sort of fall in line, you know, it's, um, and they're not going to challenge him. Right. So I think a great training scenario would be to have a senior officer, you know, maybe cross the line, you know, uh, um, be physical with somebody and then have two or three other officers that are in training either look to see if they will tell him, hey, don't do that, stop it, or she, you know, and then and de-escalate the situation and actually reflect it on a report. That's an important piece, too. So I think that's a spectacular training opportunity that I was actually going to propose to our training lieutenant to say, hey, is there any way? And now once the cat gets out of the bag, it might be harder to, to keep that a secret. But the training, I think that the, the person proposed, uh, no, we don't do that. And I think that's a spectacular idea. So I, I'm just I'm happy to be able to be here and learn something. I'm like, you know what? That's something as we open up our ears and listen to communities, ask us questions. Um, and again, to go, I've talked to you about in law enforcement. Historically, we've owned deadly encounters. If there was a knife or a or a baseball bat. And I think nowadays the expectation is, no, no, we don't want you. We don't want to see those outcomes with, with those sort of deadly encounters. Yes, a gun encounters, you own those. But if someone yeah. comes at you with a, with an instrument, a blunt instrument or something, we want to see a different outcome, right? And I think that's a fair sort of challenge that the community had towards law enforcement. And that's been a, a lot of our training. Love it. Thank you, Will. I'm going to do a quick round, Robin. I'm going to ask each one of you one quick question. I want you to respond. We got about 10 more minutes and then I'm going to close where all of us to answer kind of what the next steps are. So Senator Bracey, um, it has been said that riot, riots is the language of the unheard. We know um, protesting is not illegal. There's places that are designated in your city, in your county, where you can protest. There's nothing wrong with that. I've protested before, I've marched before. But we know sometimes we see where we're looking at today where that line is crossed and the protest becomes rioting. And the extreme, which we've been seeing, is looting. And so I don't justify it. I, anybody watching looting, rioting is not the answer. We have to come to terms with this. Speak your voice, protest peacefully. Speak, and, and I can't even say peace or protest. If you're angry, just say it, but you don't have to riot and steal stuff, okay? But how can we, what can be done to make sure that citizens are being heard? And I'm gonna say this. If this happens again, I honestly don't know if our country can bounce back. If in two weeks, if in a month, there's another name, another video, makes me cry, another hashtag. I don't know if we can bounce back from this. What can we do now to make our voices heard? Well, I, I think it's happening. I think people are protesting and, and they're making their voices heard. And, and, and I'm glad to see it. As you said, I think the vandalism, uh, the rioting, I think when you're provoking police officers, I think you're going a little bit too far, but I do think uh, it's, it's important to uh, make a stand and make your voice heard. And so, you know, I, I, I appreciate the protests that are going on around the country. Uh, we, we've had our own in Orlando uh, the last two days, and I, I thought that they were appropriate. And, uh, is, you know, is, again, not to go too far as far as vandalism or provoking violence, but, but I, I think it is appropriate. And so I think it's necessary. I mean, there, there's people that are waiting for the arrest of the other three officers. And I, as, as of now, I don't think that's happened yet. So I, I think that those protests are appropriate. Um, and I, I think we need to continue to keep the pressure on uh, for the arrest of the other officers. That, that's my opinion. And, and so, I think we will see another uh, incident, but you know, I think there needs to be, uh, people need to know that there will be repercussions uh, when something like this happens. And so I, I think these, these protests are necessary. 
Very good. Thank you, Senator Bracey. Round Robin, Will, United Nations, 2014, under the Obama administration, stated, based on their research and their task force, that they show signs and data that there's racial bias and racial profiling in policing. What can someone do if they feel that they're being racially profiled? So uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think that's a, in addition to just the racial profiling piece of it that they came out with, I think there was some um, infrastructural discrimination. There was some voting suppression issues that were happening, I think, out of the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson. So there's a lot of issues going on at the time. So I, I think in, um, what's fascinating to me is I think the racial profiling piece, as I present it to law enforcement, and, and, um, and when I talk about disproportionate minority contacts as well, I, I think that, that at the end of the day, when, when someone suggests, you know, um, uh, true or not, that, that, that you were racial, that you racially profiled somebody, or that you arrested that person because they're African American. So what it does, it, it does hurt, you know, that, that we all are human and it doesn't, it doesn't feel good, you know, to have that allegation uh, against you. But I think we, we need to, to understand those perceptions and those perceptions are also officer safety issues. And if those perceptions exist, and if we practice decorum and procedural justice, I think there's an opportunity to have that encounter with that person who may have felt like that they were racial profiled to de-escalate that situation, to mm -hmm. walk that through and to have that communication, understanding, you know, again, with decorum and dignity with each other, that they don't feel that way. So that initial encounter, they might feel that way, but I believe it's incumbent upon the officers. We're the professionals. We have all the accoutrements. We have the training, right? We, we pulled the car over. Okay. And I think it's really incumbent upon us to undo that perception. And I think that's the challenge with law enforcement. And, and, and a big part of that, to go, I know that we teach it, it's when somebody would call in and, and advise that, hey, I've got two young black males walking in my neighborhood. And, and, and a typical response would be, uh, excuse me, young men, what are you doing in this neighborhood? You know, well, we live here. You know, so it's, it's we need to understand how hurtful that question alone is. And I think that piece of training to officers, their, their dismount, has got to be done better. You know, they need to get out of their cars, go up, shake those youth's hands and introduce themselves, hand in their cards and say, tell your parents to give me a call. I want to tell them how respectful you were. You know, so yeah. there, there needs to be a different approach, I think, you know, with, with some of our training. But uh, it's it's something that you and I will continue to work on. To go on. Absolutely. Very good. Will and, I, and I'll say Will says this in training and I love it. Um, he said he teaches police officers. Don't don't come up to a black boy in a neighborhood and say, what are you doing in this neighborhood? because that child could be living in that neighborhood. Um, every child, every black child doesn't live in the in poverty, doesn't live in the hood. There's black children that live behind gated communities. And so I love that he says that, don't say, Why, what are you doing here? You know, ask, you know, here's my information. How can I help? So I love that approach. And I'll say this as well, if any, anybody watching and you want implicit bias training or explicit bias, bias training or racial bias training or training on how to interact with youth, minority youth, please reach out to me. Please reach out to Will. Um, if you want training for your company, if you want training for your organization, it is important. And I think also what's important is that your employees, your staff, your colleagues see that this topic is important to you and that you have policies in place and trainings in place to make sure that this is decreased as much as possible. Round Robin, Dr. Pamela, your question. Um, Will talked about racial profiling from a criminal justice perspective. For you, um, can you share with us, especially being the first black um, to receive a doctorate in engineering in Oklahoma, if someone is feeling they're racially discriminated or racially profiled in college or in at work, what can they do? What have you done? What have been your experiences? Well, I mean, that's definitely something that takes place. Um, oftentimes, a faculty member will have lower expectations for a minority student and won't feel like that they are as capable, so may not um, also give them the opportunities or access to research experiences uh, in their lab. So when something like that is happening, first of all, if it's explicit, we have laws against that. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It happens every day. But go to administration immediately. And, and first of all, document it, then go to administration and explain what is happening to you. 
Okay, and so that's something that I think a, a lot of students may be uh, afraid to do, but then you will be protecting yourself if you do that. And so actually document it, go to administration immediately and tell them what is happening to you. And then also don't try to fight this battle alone. I mean, obviously there are EEOC organizations um, in, in the government and in, in organizations, um, private companies also generally have some diversity uh, officers, but don't don't feel like you have to do all of this by yourself. Join other organizations, organizations within many organizations have affinity groups where, they'll, where you can have uh, organizations of African-Americans, uh, employee organization or Hispanic employee organization, or even women. And then talk to those folks about it, because a lot of times when these things happen in school or in the workplace, uh, people of color feel marginalized and just will leave. And I always say, because the, the fact of the matter is over 52% uh, of women leave STEM fields before they're in their mid-career era, era. And it's because of this marginalization and women of color ex experience it even more. And I say, don't go, don't go. Find those allies, identify organizations that, that can support you. And it's, if it's explicit, uh, and, and if even if it's not explicit, even if it's point it out and bring it to the attention of administration if you're a student, if you're an employee, bring it to uh, the attention of leaders in your organization, because if they, if you don't do it, it's going to happen to the next person. And so I've always been willing to take that stand and it's been rough sometimes over my 30 plus year career. I got my first engineering degree over 30 years ago and it's been difficult some days, but I'm always fueled on more when I think about how it can make a difference for those who are coming behind me. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Pastor Dio, final um, round robin question for you. How can we heal as a community? Yeah, <clears throat> no, thank you for that question. It's a very sensitive question in many ways. And I think that really is there a simple solution for a complex problem. There's an African proverb that says the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down just to feel its warmth. Mm. Wow. Say that one more time, sir. I felt like we were in church. One more time. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down just to feel its warmth. Mm. And we talk about, for example, some of the rioting and looting that we're seeing. And I know this is going to be a contrarian statement but it is the thinking that we also have to consider from everybody out there. The reality is that the African-American has been looted for over 200 years. They have been looted. I say they because I am not an African-American. However, I am a Dominican and a minority and I can relate and understand because I too felt racism against my own people because oftentimes in Dominican Republic, it is a divided country by those who have light complexion and a certain texture here. And those of us who may be the darker skinned Dominicans, very racially sensitive in that country. And I can say that just from the lenses of the outside in, the African-American person also has been looted for the last 200 years. European peasants, were given land, but yet the African-American was not looted. They were promised certain things and these things were given to other ethnicities, but yet to them specifically, it was not given to them, looted. Taking from me, the, 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 the violation, the emotion behind being looted is that you have uh, violated what is mine. You have violated what belongs to me. And so what we're seeing in my opinion in these riots is the external reaction because of something that is felt internally. And so to answer your question regarding how do we heal as a community, I think that one of the key things that we have to do similar to that African proverb is that we need to begin to embrace everyone within our respective village. Why does it have to be a black community or a black section of town? And why does it have to be a Caucasian 
section of town? Why does it have to be uh, a Hispanic section of town? Why does it have to be an Asian section of town? Why is there a Chinatown? The reality is that we're going to be more comfortable with people who may look like us. And until we start breaking down those barriers, and until we start literally diminishing this ideology of I can relate to somebody who looks more like me, we're gonna to continue to have this challenge of division or differentiation. This country, in my opinion, is more divided than it's ever been. And it's happening and you're feeling the tension and you're seeing that. And the only way that we're really going to solve this thing is by all of us being intentional and understanding that there is these biases that exist. How do we overcome these biases? How do we, <coughs> excuse me, how do we overcome these biases? Uh, I forgot the lady's name and I, and I hate to uh, not remember her name because by no means am I taking credit for what she said. Uh, but during the civil movement, she mentioned that um, at times you have to educate. And if the education ain't working, then sometimes you have to legislate. And if legislation ain't working, then sometimes you have to agitate. And I think it's a contrarian statement because we feel somewhat sensitive because of what we're seeing. <laughs> But so long as we're not embracing that child into our village, there's always going to be somebody who feels ostracized, somebody who feels marginalized, whether it's in a corporation who is not hiring somebody because their name doesn't sound like their name or their accent might be different from the come on. But we know these things are taking place every single day. And so until we are becoming more self-aware and more introspective and understand that, you know what? Hey, I did, I'm, I'm experiencing bias right now. This is my own personal bias. Let me be mindful of, self-aware that I am, if I see somebody who has a, 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 you know, a turban with a big beard, am I going to be intimidated and not greet them? Or am I going to be intentional and realize that is a bias that is being fed to me by media, a bias that is being fed to me by other communication channels? Let me go ahead and say hello to them. The moment that we start feeling something that is indifferent towards another person, at that moment, do the opposite of what you would normally do. It's like what I teach our church all the time. Instead of the moment you start feeling envy over someone else's success, at that moment, literally go against that feeling of envy and begin to compliment that person for their successes. And don't let that envy take root in your heart or your mind. I think it's the same aspect when it comes to us as, as citizens of a society, of a culture is, the moment you begin to experience or see or feel that there is some bias taking place, take the opposite action. Because in that we become better as a whole. About 15 years ago, one of my spiritual mentors, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes, he said something that was so profound that to this day, I still remind myself about this. He says, exposure, exposure gives you options. Options give you choices and choices require decisions. Exposure gives you options. Options give you choices and choices require decisions. If we want to make better decisions, we have to become more exposed. Become more exposed to different cultures. Become more exposed to different thought processes. Become more exposed to the way other people might do something who don't look like you. Become more exposed in your circle of friends and begin to gain insight and ideas and relationship from those who don't look like you. That is how we're going to heal as a community, is by diversifying and welcoming and embracing those who don't look like us. Very good. Thank you so much, Pastor Dio. That was a mouthful, but you touched on so much. All of you with the round robin, thank you so much for those tidbits. And I just want to summate um, some of the things that we talked about tonight and just kind of cover, because again, I don't want, I didn't want this conversation to be emotional, which it was not. It was very educational. And so I just want to talk about kind of what are our next steps? What are those things we're going to do um, if you're watching, it, 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 it's it's your responsibility. Now, when you hear, you got to do something with what you heard. And so number one, the, just kind of the resounding um, response was number one was educate. And so we want to encourage you to learn 
about, you know, biases that you may have. Um, also make sure that you, if you're in a place of position of power, or if you're in a place where um, you can bring in trainings into your company, bring these things up, talk about culture diversity, talk about diversity training, talk about sensitivity training, talk about bias training, be that voice to be a difference, even in the place of work, because we know economically, a lot of decisions are made based on money, based, based on corporations. So be that voice, write your boss this week, email your company, say, hey, here's some things that's bothering me. Here's some things I'm looking at. I would like to suggest a training. I would like to suggest this particular uh, webinar. So reach out and you can do something today by number one, ed offering education and make sure that training is available in the place that you work, even the place where you volunteer or a place where you sow your time. And so we want to encourage you to do that. Number two, again, what was just consistent in our talk today is reporting. And I like the word Daya used, aggravate or agitate, report, report, report. Thank you, Dr. Pamela, for sharing. If you feel that you're being discriminated against at work, report it. If you feel like you're being discriminated against in school, report it. If you feel like you're being discriminated against or racially profiled by law enforcement, report it. Everyone needs to speak up. Let's not wait until another video come out. Let's not wait and just be reactive. Be proactive and speak up and document it. Put it in writing and tell someone so that they know that a wrong took place. And I love what Senator Bracey said. You have the right to do a protest. Do it peacefully, but protest. Make sure your voice is being heard. Be a part of the movement. Be a part of what you're seeing if you know that speaks to you. And so, again, if wrong is being done, report. And I just want to add this piece in there. Even if it's not being done to you, if you see a colleague being discriminated against, if you see a, a, a student, a peer, a friend being discriminated against, report on their behalf, report what you're seeing. If we stay silent, we're part of the problem. Number three, what we say consistently is acknowledge. Acknowledge that you have bias. Acknowledge that you laughed at that joke. Acknowledge that you thought that about that particular race or that particular gender. Acknowledge it, own it and say, I need to move on from here. And if you're in, still in the state of saying, I don't have any biases, I encourage you to go to harvard.edu, take the implicit bias test, it's free. I don't get paid to advertise for them. I just know that it is a wealth of knowledge and it will help you realize and acknowledge you have biases. And once you realize those biases, work on it so you don't operate out of those biases. Number four, we said diversify. If you are a CEO and you're watching this, if you are a business owner and you're watching this, if you are a pastor and you're watching this, if you're an executive director and you're watching this, look at your leadership team. Is your leadership team diversified? If you are a pastor and everybody on your leadership team is white, but your congregation is diverse, you got to bring some changes. Be concerned about what's concerning the people that you serve. If you are a pastor, if you are a business, diversify. Make sure that you have people that don't just look like you working for you or making decisions. I would also say to those that are career oriented or entrepreneurs, get to the table. They, even if they're not trying to diversify, knock on the door. Let them know you belong there. Tighten up your resume. Revise your LinkedIn profile. Do what you have to do to get to the table, because once one person gets to the table that looks different and those biases and stereotypes are thrown out the door, you just open the door for someone else. Get to the table, diversify, be at those tables where decisions are being made and not just dished out. And so I want to encourage you to diversify and then diversify your friendships. Find some friends that may not be the same color as you. Invite people over. Let them see we're all human. We do the same things. We may have some different culture persuasions, but at the end of the day, our blood is still the same. Our heart is still the same. We all want to be happy. We all want a healthy family. We all want to be safe. And so diversify your circle of friends and influence. And then lastly, and, and, and um, Senator Bracey touched on this, and I want to echo this again, vote. Vote. I know we're upset. No, we don't like what we're seeing, but it's not going to change until we do something. Get to the polls. 
volunteer at the polls. I volunteer all the time. They need to see more of us. Encourage people to go vote. And if there's people currently in office that have not shown you that they're concerned about your issues, they don't deserve your vote. Reach out to them, talk to them, tell them what you need to see in order for them to receive your vote and go vote. And then let me say this also, if you're looking at, at the lineup and nobody is really representing what you want, go run. We don't have to just vote. We can run. Go run for office. Get some people to support you and know that you have what is necessary to bring about change. If it hurts you, if it makes you cry, you have already what you need to bring about change. And so I, I want to encourage you all today to know there is justice for everybody. This is a Christian platform. We are here as a church. And I just want to say before we close that God is still sitting on the throne. He still loves us. He made us different for a reason. And so embrace your differences, embrace who you are, but also respect others' differences and love the way that God loves unconditionally and so that we can have a better tomorrow. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Once again, I want to thank my panelists. They are phenomenal and amazing. My hubby bubby, Pastor Dio, businessman, my partner, my trainer, my co-trainer, Mr. Will Haboso. We'll be training again. You know, we've gotten booked for more trainings. And if you all need trainings, reach out to us. Senator Bracey, I am forever grateful. Thank you so much for taking out time to be with us. You've been so busy this week. And I appreciate you finding this important to you. I want to talk with you again on just some things that you're working on from a reform perspective. I'm going to be working on pulling some people together. And I think collaboration is important. So thank you so much. Love your family. Your sister's a good friend of mine. Those of you that don't know, um, Senator Bracey, father, um, is a well-known, respected individual in the community, the president of the NAACP for many years. His mom, they hold family bad. The Bracey's got it going on. So look them up, support them, check out what he's doing. He's always posting. As he said, I went to Tallahassee about an issue. He took out time of his schedule to meet with us, to meet with our team. And so what you see is what you get. Dr. Pamela, you know, I love you. She's my mentor. She is so focus on making sure there's more black, brown skin and women in places of leadership. I'm in a leadership position because of your mentorship. So thank you for stopping by to mentor us and talk to us. I am so grateful for all of you. God bless you. I'm just going to ask Pastor Dio, will you close us out in prayer? Absolutely. A quick absolutely. prayer. You already preached. It's a real quick it's, it's 30 <laughs> second prayer. I did not preach. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for just an incredible opportunity to even have these kind of technologies to go ahead and combine, to align, to strategize, to systematize, to put things in action, God, thoughts, ideas, that may be a seed right now, but a seed is all we need to move the mountain. So I pray, Father God, that those who are watching, those who are listening, those who have been affected and impacted by some of these things that have happened, I pray that strengthen you, Father, looking over specifically, God, even George's family right now, they're dealing with these circumstances. But I do pray God for across the entire nation that there be a spirit of unity, no longer division, that everybody is embracing of one another, no longer fearing one another. And that those who might have erroneous and, and errors in their thinking due to biases, I pray God that they become self-aware of these biases so that they too can now align for the greater purpose in aligning this nation. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. thank you all so much, please like, share, post, replay this. Thank you all so much once again for your time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night. I love Good night. you. Good night.